give a special welcome to, I was surprised this morning, as many of you probably saw, uh, an old colleague of mine, Don Solberg. We worked together many years ago, so you can see him afterwards and he'll tell you where the bodies are buried. But uh, Don and his wife, Nina, showed up, surprised us this morning. They actually are from, uh, well, I assume you still live in Wisconsin. We didn't get that far, but have a daughter now who's living close by that they are visiting and somehow found us. So we're grateful to have you here. Welcome. And uh, please welcome them afterwards as well. If you haven't been out by the new church lately, you need to drive by. The, uh, the walls are starting to go up, the insulation is there, the roof is on, and it's beginning to look like uh, a real building. And uh, you can follow on Facebook and on the uh, website both where some pictures get posted periodically. So uh, keep up with it that way as well. But very grateful for how you are giving to support that. Uh, we kind of give you an update each week in the bulletin so you can see where we are financially on that. But uh, thank you for all that you're doing to make that a reality. We're certainly praying that God uses this for his glory as we get to that point, which will be sometime, hopefully, before the end of the year. So we think we're on schedule for that still at this moment. Well, I want to read for you from uh, the book of Philippians beginning in chapter 1 this morning. As we are working our way through this book, I should say chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. Let's pray. Father, this is a challenging passage of Scripture, as you know. And yet, in the verses that follow the ones we've just read that we'll look at starting next week, what an example you give us personally through the person of Jesus Christ, of someone who lived this out in a way that would be far above anything we could ever hope to do. So I pray that as we look at this this morning, you will guide us into the truth that's here, that you will help us to live out what it is that you've given us to do as those who are believers in you. We pray for those, Father, who are distant from us this morning, we, whether they're traveling or whatever. We pray for safety for them. We pray for our REACH team as they'll be going down to Houston later this month. And, uh, Lord, we pray that these will be life-changing experiences for the, for the youth who go, for the adults who will be with them, for those whose homes they will be helping to uh, improve. But, Lord, we pray... Um, that most of all, there will be those who would come to know you as Savior and Lord through this experience. Selfishly, we pray that the weather might be a little cooler down there that time of year, and so we pray that there would be that safety factor that you would give to them, keep them from any harm uh, due to the heat or any other reasons while they go. Thank you for the VBS that we've just been through, for the, all those who participated, for the Lord, the message of the gospel that was given to these young hearts. We pray that uh, these will be things that even these children will remember perhaps years from now. That the investment here in time will have been one that has eternal value. So we thank you for that opportunity. Pray for those who are being persecuted for your namesake around the world right now as we speak. Those who in the next day or two will face death because they claim Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's hard to believe, Lord, in our world in which we live that this can still go on, and yet we know that it's happening in many places and in many ways. We ask that those who are facing this kind of persecution will, be, will, will know that there are those who care and those who are praying for them, and most of all, that they will have a, or just a, an, an overwhelming sense of your presence and of your um, of your faith in them, your trust in them, and of your protection over them. Thank you, Father, for being our Father. Thank you for this time together. We pray that you will use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
If you haven't already, please turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. You know, the Bible says an interesting thing. It says, what goes around comes around, right? You didn't know that was in the Bible. Uh, Perhaps it's a little bit of a paraphrase of the verse we were looking at last month. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another, right? You get the point. If we are choosing to tear down other believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, sooner or later it's going to come back on us. What goes around comes around. This is what the Bible is teaching there. Robert Fulton, in his book, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, says this. He says, share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them. Anybody hearing their mother's voice in their ears at this point? Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that are not yours. Say you're sorry. Wash your hands before you eat. Watch for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. He said he learned it all in kindergarten. Well, Paul's instruction here this morning is basically something like this. Some of y'all need to go back to kindergarten spiritually. Some of y'all need to relearn some things that are kind of basic to the faith that you now claim in Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 1 through 11, as we've said before, is one of the most basic yet profound passages of Scripture in all the Bible. That's profound truth that relates to the person of Christ that we'll get into beginning next week. But it's all to support the instruction that he's giving here in the first four verses. And so we've, we've said the theme of this passage is unity through humility. Unity through humility tough, both of them, but I think the humility part may be the toughest of all. But he gives us, first of all, the motive in verse 1, which is the work of the triune God in our own lives, as we saw a couple weeks ago. The motive, the mission in verse 2, to be of the same mind, to be unified. And now today we want to look at the means in verses 3 and 4, which is the humility part, and then the model in verses 5 through 11 that we'll look at starting next week. So the means, how do we achieve unity through humility? Easy. All you have to do is go against every natural inclination that you ever had. That's all you have to do. And you'll have unity through humility. It is not easy. It's like starting over in kindergarten. It's like relearning life. And in many ways, that's what the Christian life is. You know, as you think about it, the kingdom principles, if we can call them that, things the Bible teaches about how to live which will glorify God and be good for us, are almost always absolutely upside down from what the world teaches us, right? Almost always. So it's kind of like relearning life when you come to faith in Christ and realize there's a different way to live. It doesn't come naturally. In fact, it takes supernatural power. It's really the power of the risen Christ living through us that will make this possible in our lives. But Paul gives us guidelines here what this would look like and what's the means of achieving this. It's really There's really five of them beginning in the middle of verse 3 through verse 4. We're going to, some of them are so close, we're going to condense those down into just two. Just two. Because they're so close together. One negative, one positive. Here's the means of achieving unity through humility. Number one, the negative one, spurn selfish ambition driven by concern for self. Spurn selfish ambition driven by concern for self. Verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition or rivalries, depending on which version you have there, or conceit. The two greatest enemies of unity. The two greatest enemies of unity are the desire or the need to be recognized and secondly, the desire to be right. Those two things, the desire to be recognized, the desire to be right, selfish ambition and conceit. 
Time after time, these have been the things that have torn church after church after church apart. Selfish ambition or rivalries. It's all one word in the original. It's a word that originally meant, it was originally used to speak of a politician who would want to get his, get his political office by, means, by unfair means. Selfish ambition. So it came to came to define any ambition, any attitude that wanted to get to be number one, that wanted to get to the top by any means. You know, it didn't matter who was in the way, what or who was in the way, they would climb over that in order to get to the top. Now, in most churches, this kind of ambition isn't usually quite so obvious, although sometimes it is. But usually it's a little more subtle, but it still is what? It's insisting that it has to be my way. Why? Because I'm right. It has to be my way because I, nobody, you know, we always think it's unique that we want it our way because we're right, as though anybody ever wanted their way because they thought it was wrong. That doesn't happen, right? Everybody thinks they're right. So this is where selfish ambition enters into the church and gets into our own lives. I deserve this office. I deserve this position. I deserve to have this recognition. I deserve, because of my expertise, to be able to define how we should do this or how we should do that. We have these high opinions of ourselves that kind of put us front and center. The very attitude that comes with that probably suggests we're not the right person for the job or they're not the right person to make the decision, right? Paul used this word, selfish ambition or rivalries. He used it back in chapter 1, verse 17. If you're in Philippians, you can just look back there. He said the former, and when he says the former there, he's talking about these fellow believers in Rome. He was in prison. He had fellow believers there who were very jealous of him. Remember when we talked about that as we went through that part of the passage. The former, these Romans who were jealous of Paul, proclaimed Christ. They're preaching the gospel, but they're doing it out of Selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So you can even, you know, if you pay attention here, you can be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Selfish ambition can be a right thing done for the wrong reason. You can be perfectly right about, you know, what music is most appropriate or, or how loud the drums should be, since we didn't have them this morning. You can say whatever you want today, I guess, about the drums, right? We'll uh, let Jim in on that next week. You know, we, we have our own opinions. What dishes should be used? What tablecloths? How should we do this? How should we do that? We have our own issues where we can be, but the point is we can be perfectly right about the issue and perfectly wrong in motive. Driven by selfish ambition. That's what Paul's getting at here. And, and, and let me put it this way. If your attitude is causing disunity, you're wrong no matter how right you are, right? You're wrong no matter how right you are. And we kind of have to recognize this and, and, and begin to understand what it means to sometimes just back off. It doesn't mean we can't express our opinion. It doesn't mean we can't say what we think would be right. But the point is to push our way through as though this is the only way this can be done. Selfish ambition. It's the desire to have a position or to Get it my way. To act according to the flesh. Galatians 5.20, you know, where Paul contrasts. What are some characteristics of those who are walking in the flesh, the old person, the old me, as opposed to the spirit that's been given to me now? What are some of the differences in those? And one of the ways that we walk in the flesh is by selfish ambition. It's called rivalries there. It's a fleshly thing. Point is, if it's become a context, got to be careful. Selfish ambition is building oneself up at the expense of tearing someone else down. If that's going on, you might be dead right, but you're still dead wrong, right? Selfish ambition. It's that attitude that says it must be my way or the highway. You can be someone who is devouring others by your own selfish ambition. You know, what goes around comes around. 
And we may be the one who is the winner today, but we will be the loser tomorrow. But in, in through all of this, the real loser is the church, right? It's the body of Christ. It's those of us who are trying to represent Christ to the world. And now giving a picture that's an unfair picture because it doesn't re really reflect who Jesus is. It doesn't reflect what the Trinity is, where perfect love exists. We're giving a false picture. John MacArthur says, Discord and division are inevitable when people focus on their agendas to the exclusion of others in the church. Where did he get that? He got it from the book of James. In James chapter 3, verse 14, James says this, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast. And be false to the truth. I know I'm right. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. It's so devastating because it sneaks up on us unawares, right? It just seems like if I know I'm right, I should push this way this through. I sh it should be done my way. I should get the recognition that I deserve. You know, the Bible even speaks to that, even the Old Testament. There's, there's a wonderful verse in, the, in Proverbs 27. This is one you might want to make sure your kids know. The verse says, let another praise you and not your own mouth. That's not exactly what our world teaches these days, is it? You don't have to see too many athletes be interviewed to realize we got a different opinion of who should be doing the praising. The Bible says, just keep your mouth shut and let somebody else praise you. You say, but nobody praises me. I don't get the recognition I deserve. That's when, beloved, we have to remember we have an audience of one, right? God is our audience. God doesn't miss it. God gets it right. And what's more important, to be right in the eyes of some person because you've pushed your way through or to be right in the eyes of God? You know, I think sometimes we think, man, if I, I just, this has to go my way because I know I'm right and uh, I need to get the recognition I deserve here. You know, be careful because God tends to give people what they deserve, right? Got to be kind of careful. Ambrose was a great teacher in the early church, 300s. Some may remember, uh, have heard of him. He was the bishop in Milan, but that's not where he started out. He started out as a governor. You know, the, 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 the uh, teaching, the church, and the state were pretty closely related in those days. And he started out as a governor, even though he had, he had theological education. He was the governor of a, of a, of a province in, in uh, Italy called Liguria. Milan is a part of that province, but the bishop of Milan had passed away, so they had a meeting to decide, or to at least talk about who should be the next bishop, and some child in this audience started crying out, Ambrose, bishop, Ambrose, bishop, and pretty soon the whole crowd took up the cry. Now, when I read that, I thought, man, I thought that kind of cheering was 20, 20th century. I didn't realize they did it in the old days, but apparently it's nothing new. Ambrose, bishop. Well, Ambrose was so taken uh, aback by that, he ran out of the room. He didn't think he was deserving of this high office. He wouldn't even consider that this should be his until the emperor actually told him, Ambrose, you will be bishop of Milan. He was loved by his people. He was a great man. He was a major influence on Augustine, who became certainly one of the great theologians in the history of the church, Ambrose. But there was no selfish ambition with him. He actually ran the other way. Wouldn't it be good if we kind of had the same thing going on uh, other than being willing when the Lord has clearly called us to something? What, ca what causes selfish ambition? Conceit. The second thing in that passage, right? Conceit. Paul knows where it comes from. Conceit, the compulsion to be right. I'm right, therefore I must get my way. That thinking, highly, more highly of ourselves than we ought. You know, the word that Paul uses there for conceit is a really interesting word. It's the, the Greek word is kenodoxia. Kenodoxia comes from two Greek words. The first one, kenos, which means empty, and doxa, which means glory. 
God's definition of conceit is empty glory. You're going for something that you don't deserve. Looking for something that's not your right. This is an illegitimate pursuit of glory. As soon as we think we're something, we've proven that we're nothing. Empty glory. Vain glory. The King James Bible calls it vain glory. It's a more literal translation of the word. It's not the real thing. All conceit falls into this category. You know, truth is, none of us deserve the attention we do get, let alone that which we would like to get, right? Vain glory. Compare that. Now, if you're in Philippians 2, just, just compare that. Look down in verse 5, and you'll see an interesting thing. Paul kind of has a little bit of a play on words here. In verse 5, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, meaning the morphe, the literal essence of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. You see that word nothing there, made himself nothing? It's the word kenos. So what Paul is saying is, here you are putting yourself forward with empty glory while God is, while Jesus is emptying himself of real glory. It's about as backwards as it could possibly be. And he's the example that Paul is going to point us to. So he says, don't be the one who is trying to vainly get glory. Be like Jesus who gave up the real thing. And if you happen to have a little bit of it, be willing to give it up. Seeking glory that we don't deserve is doing the opposite of what Jesus would have us do and it would be the opposite of what he did in order that we could have eternal life. And I'll tell you what, when we begin to chase things like that, begin to chase vain glory, begin to figure out that it's our, our way or no way at all, I mean, strange things really happen. Some really, things get silly. There was a church in Dallas not long ago, that was, they got into a big fight and they became so divided that pretty soon this party over here, this group of people and this group of people filed lawsuits against each other. They wanted the property. So each one was claiming we should get it. This despite the fact, by the way, that 1 Corinthians 6, 1 says what? It says when you have a grievance against one another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Jesus, is, God is basically saying, I want you to see you guys in law courts against one another. But these apparently didn't believe that part of the Bible, and so they had gone to law against each other. And the judge, who was a very wise man, said, sounds like an internal issue to me. And he referred it back to the denomination and said, you guys sort it out yourself. So the denomination finally came together and said, okay, this group... We'll get the property, and the other guys don't. Couldn't, they couldn't get them to come together, so the losers were just out. They didn't get anything. But meantime, there was a reporter who had been chasing this story the whole time. And as he dug deeper and deeper into this, he finally got back to, the, to, to, to trace this scandal to its source. And you know what the source of the problem was? They'd had a church picnic of some kind, a church social, and one of the elders got a smaller slice of ham than one of the kids that was sitting next to him. Out of that, all the rest of this came. Now, we laugh, but tell me you haven't been there sometime. It gets really silly, beloved. I want to make sure we're not going there, because it's for sure Jesus didn't leave them there. They didn't follow Jesus to get where they got. You know, David succumbed to the same thing. David decided in 1 Chronicles 21, we're told that Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to number Israel. What, what's he doing there? Well, you remember David came to power and the nation was pretty divided. It had little tribes of people here, there, and everywhere. But under David, the, the, the nation was unified. And David got to a certain point in life and he began to think, man, this is great what's happened here. I think I'll figure out how glorious I really am and I'll count these people. 
I want to find out how many I got. Even his military commander, Joab, told him, David, you shouldn't be doing this. You're, you're, you're aiming at the wrong thing. But David went ahead and did it anyway. As a result of that pride on David's part, God came along, gave him three options of things that could happen, you may remember, as a discipline in his life. And he chose the one that said there would be a plague, and 70,000 Israelites died as a result of David's sin. What was God doing? God was saying to David, listen, you want to glorify yourself with numbers? Let me take a few away. Then you tell me how glorious you are. Vain glory. We have a lot of ways, beloved, of thinking we've kind of got it together and everybody else doesn't. Isaiah reminds us, and this is something David forgot. Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah 48, 11. God says this, he says, my glory I will not give to another. Now that's not God being proud and egocentric. It's God saying my glory is the thing that's going to be best for me and it's going to be best for you. The glory always goes to God. What do you have that you did not receive, he says in 1 Corinthians 4. Sometimes we're not very mindful of that. So how do we have unity through humility? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. We need to check our selfish ambition at the door, right? Back to kindergarten, spiritually, to relearn the way we look at things and the attitudes we take toward people. So that's the negative. That's the negative. Spurn selfish ambition driven by concern for self. What's the positive? Well, as you would expect, the positive is just the opposite of that. The positive is seek selfish, selfless humility driven by concern for others. Seek selfless humility driven by concern for others. Verses, middle of verse 3 through verse 4, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one look not only to his own interests but also the interests of others. Humility, here we are with that word again, right? Literally of low mind. It was, it was a word that was, you almost never find in ancient Greek or Roman literature. Why? Because they considered humility a weakness, like most people today do. So they just didn't use the word. It wasn't something they thought about, but of course humility is a is a core virtue in Christianity. It was, a, it was at the heart of what Jesus did in coming in the first place to provide salvation for us. It's at the heart of what, how we should live as Christians, as those who claim the name of Christ to reflect him to the world. It's a humble existence. It's, frankly, it's the way, how do you come to faith in Christ in the first place? You repent your sins, which is a pretty humble act. It's one reason some people never get there. They cannot humble themselves before God to say, you're greater than I am. To say, you paid for the sins that I cannot possibly pay for on my own. Humility is at the core of, of our Christian faith. It's the supreme virtue of Christian existence, really. And so, it's why the Bible often goes back to this. Some of the strongest leaders in the Bible were humble men. The Bible says concerning Moses in Numbers 12, verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. Now, part of the reason that he was so meek was because God knocked the stuffing out of him for a while. You remember that. But he got him to the point. In fact, in fact, the outline, I'm always tempted every time I talk to Moses, to give you this outline because it's such a great outline. I don't know where it came from. I think Jim Boyce, but it's not mine. But the outline of Moses' life, he spent 40 years thinking he was something. He spent 40 years finding out from God that he, he was nothing. And then he spent 40 years finding out what God can do with nobodies. Two million people he took out of captivity in Egypt because God led him to do that. But at the same time, God could say of him, he was the most humble man on the face of the earth when that was going on. That's an amazing statement. It doesn't mean you can't be useful. It doesn't mean you can't be a leader. It doesn't mean you can't do things that are right before God. But it means you do them with an attitude of dependence on God, not dependence on yourself. Humility. 
David was a humble man. He was anointed king when Saul was still on the throne, you may remember. And Saul was jealous of David because of his military victories. And so he was trying to run him down and kill him. And twice when that was going on, not once, but twice, David had him in his sights. He had him right where he could kill him. And both times, even though his men urged him to do that, he refused because he said, I can't touch God's anointed. He was a humble man. Paul, arguably the most influential Christian outside of Jesus that ever walked the face of the earth, was a very humble man. He had to often depend, de defend his apostleship because he was a little different than the other apostles. He came along later. He was born, as he said, born out of season. He was, he was late on the scene, late in coming to faith in Christ. But he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Never left far from his mind that he was a, a murderer and a persecutor of God's church originally. And this, this isn't just, aw, shucks, you know, keep it coming kind of stuff from Paul. He really meant this. He says in Ephesians 3, 8, For to me, though I am the very least of all the saints. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. It's no wonder Paul urges this same attitude on other believers, right? He knew how to live it. Peter, we might say Peter had a lot to be humble about. Perhaps that's true, but Peter was a humble, became a humble man. Again, God kind of worked this into his life through a few hardships here and there. But he says in 1 Peter 5 verse 5, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. With humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You want to get on the wrong side of God? Push yourself forward. That's all you got to do. Do everything the world tells you to look out for number one, to be in charge, to be front and center. God opposes the proud. It's exactly what Jesus, the ultimate example, did not do that we're doing. He gave away real glory. We're pursuing vain glory. We're pushing ourselves forward. So humility is the answer. So how do you get humility? <laughs> Sit down one day and decide, I think I'll be humble, right? Right? Of course, the minute you do that, you, you're not, right? C.S. Lewis had, did this very effectively in the screw tape letters. He had, you know, this is, this is that, um, this is that, um, what would you call it? His, his representative book of, a, of, a, of the head demon in the world of demons telling his nephew, uh, the, the head demon is screw tape, but he tells his nephew who is working on some, here, he tells him this at one point in that book, he says, I see your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to this fact? Catch him at a moment when he's really poor in spirit and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection, by Jove, I'm being humble. And almost immediately pride, pride at his own humility, will appear. Do you see why it's so hard to be humble? It's tough. Because the minute you think you got there, you're not. so hard to be humble. So hard to be humble. And yet this is what the Bible tells us we need to do. So what do most of us do? Well, we overcorrect. We begin to look down on ourselves. We, we find out how to be self-abasing. We deflate ourselves. We itemize all of our faults and shortcomings. And, you know, there's a sense in which we need to do that. We need to understand we have a lot of those. We need to be confessing them. We need to be seeking God's help to overcome those shortcomings. And we need to be constantly aware that they are there. But, but, our, but our attention on those, in order to become humble, can be another pride of its own sort. Look how, look how good I look at myself as bad. It's its own form of pride. So what in the world... Do you do? This seems hopeless. Here's what Lewis says. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself 
less. That's pretty wise stuff, isn't it? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. You can have a legitimate opinion of the gifts and abilities God has given you. You can thank him for the successes that are part of your life. But humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. So how do I do that? How do I think of myself less? In some ways, the harder I try to do that, the worse it is. You know, you tell a new driver. Wait till your kids are there if, you, if they haven't already been there. Tell a new driver, don't go off the right side of the road, right? What are they going to do? They're almost certainly going to go off the right side of the road. Why? Because they'll be focused on that. I don't want to go off the right side of the road, and bam, the first thing you know, that's all they're looking at, and that's where they go. Because what you concentrate on is what tends to happen. So how do I not think less of myself, but think of myself less? Paul has the answer. It's right here in this passage. Here's the answer if you're really serious about following the Lord's example of humility, of building humility into your life. His answer is, how do I think less of myself? By thinking of others more. How do I think of myself less? By thinking of others more. Instead of every time I get up in the morning, what am I going to do today? What am I going to accomplish? What is on my agenda? How can I help somebody else today? How can I put somebody else front and center in my life and in my attention today? Instead of thinking of the thing I want to avoid, I think about others. Now, I think it's interesting. Paul doesn't say, don't think of your interests at all. Thankfully, he didn't do that. So now you can think of your own interests, but, but think also on the interests of others. Balance your self-centeredness with some other centeredness. But then he gives the priority. It's not quite a balance. It's give a little more to the others than you give to yourself. Right? Because he says that we are to count others more significant than yourselves. That's tough. That's tough. That's even tough with, between husband and wife and children and parents, right? Probably parents to children would be the closest we might come to that. And, and, and frankly, probably mothers to children would be the closest to that. But this is what Paul is saying. I want you to be toward everybody. I want you to think of the interests of others before you think of your own. The key to humility... Beloved, this is a learned trait. This does not come natural. <laughs> this is something you have to put yourself out in order, in order to do to consider others more significant than yourself. This, this is a big order. We, in fact, we, it's big enough we will never accomplish it on our own. Thankfully, we come to the cross. We find out Jesus forgave that sin too. And so we're thankful for that. But that's the point at which we also ask Jesus to please live your resurrected life through me. For me to live is Christ, Paul said, and this is what he's talking about. I want Jesus to be living through me. I want that life of the Holy Spirit that he's given me to fill me and to control me so that I can do this, so that I can count others more significant, so that I can give their, so that I can, number one, listen to what it is they have to say, so I can, number two, express my opinion, but when it does not, doesn't look like it's getting a hearing, I can back away. I'm able to let God take over at that point. I don't have to push through. I have somebody bigger than me to, to, to make the right thing happen. I can trust him. You know, a lot of times when we're pushing our own way through, it's, we're, we're, what we're showing is a total lack of faith in God. We're saying, I, I can do this better than he can. No, you can't. Put the interests of others above your own. Sometimes the choice is really this simple. We can either be right or we can be righteous. We can either be right or we can be righteous. Which are you going to choose at that moment? 1 Peter 5.5 5, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud. 
You know, there's a reason that the Bible never urges us, be, be sure to stand up for your own rights. You know why? Because we don't have any trouble doing that. We're expert at that. We're born with that, with that tendency. We don't have to be told that, but it consistently urges us, clothe yourselves with humility, and it consistently urges us, count others more significant than yourselves. Because that doesn't come naturally. You've got to get back to kindergarten. Relearn life in order to do this. I think one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, if you're in, if you're in Philippians, just turn back a couple to, to Romans. I'm thinking this may show up as a memory verse in the next month or two. Because it's so good. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Romans 12, verse 10. If you haven't found this verse, you need to find it. Romans 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. That's hard enough if we just stopped right there, right? In other words, love other people like they were your own brother. Hopefully you love your brother. <laughs> Maybe this is as you get a little older and appreciate him a little more. Love each other with brotherly affection. But, but he didn't stop there. He said, he goes on and he says, he says, outdo one another in showing honor. Is that a beautiful phrase or what? Outdo one another in showing honor. If you're going to have a contest... Let's don't have it be a contest of wills over how we're going to spend the money or how we're going to do this or that. If you're going to have a contest, see who can give each other the, best, the most honor. And then you'll probably get proud of that and you'll have to start all over again, right? But outdo one another in showing honor. Come on, let's get there. This is where Jesus was. Show honor to others. Outdo one another at that. I love that phrase. Kent Hughes, who some of you are familiar with because we went through the book. Some of you men, we went together through that book, The Disciplines of a Godly Man. He's a guy I went to seminary with, and I knew him, and, and he went down to preach at Southern Seminary one day, Southern Seminary in Louisville. It's a wonderful seminary now. Al Mohler is the president, and he went down there, and Al Mohler, when he got down there, the two of them got talking about A.T. Robertson. A.T. Robertson used to teach at Southern Seminary until, 19, until his death in 1934. But he was the best-known Greek scholar in the world by the time of his death. His 1,400-page Greek grammar is still to this day. It's the book you go to when you want to know an answer to, the, to, the, to Greek grammar. A.T. Robertson. Wrote a couple of other books that are great too, but he was the premier Greek scholar in the world in his time and still today would be recognized in that sense. So he, he taught at the seminary. Now, while he was teaching at the seminary, it turned out he was also the, the son-in-law of John Brodus. John Brodus was the man who established Southern Seminary. And so here are these two great men. And John, John Brodus, by the way, wrote the, probably the best commentary on Matthew still to this day, in my opinion. But he also wrote a great book on preaching that is still used in most seminaries. So these are great men of God. And uh, Al Mohler, who's the president now, said to Kent Hughes when he was visiting there, he said, let me, come on, let me, let me take you out to the cemetery. I want to show you where these guys are buried, Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville. So they went out there and they arrived and Moeller pointed out this great monument to John Brodus. So this is the family put up this great monument to him out there so you can see it the minute you, you get in the gate. And Kent Hughes said, okay, well, where is, where is, is, is A.T. Robertson's buried here too? And he said, yeah, let me show you. And they went over to the monument and there on the ground, just the ground level thing was, um, was, was, this, was, the, was the gravestone for A.T. Robertson. And then Moeller said this, he said, A.T. Robertson wanted to be buried in the shadow of John Brodus. This great Greek scholar, the greatest of his time, just wanted to be buried in the shadow of his father-in-law. That's humility, beloved. That's what we need. That's what Paul is calling for here. More people that will be willing to live in the shadow of others, that are willing to have somebody else get the credit. Willing to... Let me, are you willing to do the work and watch somebody else do the credit, get the credit? Are you willing to do that? That's what he's talking about. Are you willing to see somebody else get the recognition? 
That's what he's talking about. Outdo one another in showing honor. Blaise Pascal, a great old philosopher and theologian, he says this. He said, what amazes me most is to see that everyone is not amazed at his weakness. Well, we are when we really think about it, right? But we don't act that way, and our natural inclination is not to be. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let me close with this. I told you last week about the relationship between John Wesley and George Whitfield, right? These two, two great preachers from the first awakening in U.S. history. And how they eventually had, they, they preached the same gospel, but they had a different way of coming at it. And so they had a difference of opinion on some theology, some theological points that they never could agree on. But because of the desire to be of one mind and of one accord and to have things be in order, George Whitfield, who had actually established Methodism, stepped back and let John Wesley take the leadership. Somebody asked Whitfield not long after that it all happened. He said, uh, he said I, you, were, you, were, you were willing to take the back seat here. He said, do you think you're going to see John Wesley in heaven? I mean, maybe he's not even a Christian. You know what Whitfield said? Whitfield said, no, I, I don't expect to see him in heaven. I said, really? You, you don't expect to see him? And he said, no. He said, he's going to be so close to the throne of God, so much closer than I will ever get. I don't expect to see him. Now, of course, he was exaggerating, but you see the point. He was outdoing somebody else in giving honor. Let's be that kind of Christian. Let's follow ATR, A.T. Robertson. Let's follow Paul. Let's follow David. Let's follow Jesus in regard to these things. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the challenge of your word. Sometimes, as today, Lord, the instruction is pretty clear. It's really not difficult to see what you're asking. It's very difficult to see how we're going to carry this out. So help us to know that the moment we mess up, forgiveness is already ours at the cross. We need only repent, confess our sin, and you're faithful and just to forgive us all of our sin. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's our promise to every believer. Lord, help us then to realize that available to us is the resurrected Christ. Not, not in a tomb, not lost in the annals of time, but living bodily in heaven today and available to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to accomplish what we cannot accomplish. So please help us to live that way because that's your way. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.